we were talking before the podcast about what happened at the Oscars. Chris Rock yeah. made I, what I thought was a pretty off-color joke about Jada Pinkett Smith, and she has alopecia areata, and you know Will Smith goes up and smacks him, whatever. But yeah. <laughs> you know, because I thought we were going to talk about this, alopecia areata is autoimmune hair loss. Um, for what it's worth, so I found on Reddit there was a guy on Reddit who used a carnivore diet to heal his alopecia areata. So super fascinating. Um, yeah. So for me, like I'm, I would say one of the premier channels on androgenic alopecia. And from what I've seen, like, I'm not an expert on autoimmune caused hair loss. I'm more like androgen induced miniaturization of hair follicles, but like the autoimmune component and having like localized patchy loss. And like, these are, I don't think a lot of people realize like these are organs like hair follicles. So they're prone to the same autoimmune attacks that like your other organ systems are. And this is what you see the manifestation of in times of like very high stress. Also individuals end up with localized loss, but then also presumably diet and like some sort of autoimmune reaction or leaky gut or like something that is causing like, you know, foreign invaders to be detected and like attacked by your immune system. And until you rectify that, it's just it presumably just like continues happening and you just like think you're screwed genetically but in reality it's like potentially just something you're eating the mainstream medical paradigm is you are screwed genetically and that makes and then they slam you with corticosteroids (laughs) right they'll inject corticosteroids in your scalp i mean jada was like oh it's getting steroid injections in my scalp which is going to thin the hair and the face and this guy i'll show you his photos it's pretty cool um we can put the link in the show notes or whatever for this but he was getting like patchy things on his beard and he's injecting his face, which can cause, you know, long-term permanent skin changes. But this is what I kind of rebel against with my work is this medical paradigm that these things are not treatable. And I don't think I've got all the answers. I don't have a panacea. I just think we should be asking the questions and trying to understand, are there really simple solutions to these autoimmune things? Could we create a diet if we believe that an animal-based diet, obviously, which is what I'm a fan of, is safe and effective? Like, let's recommend that. If you want to recommend a vegan diet, try that. You know, if you think meat is the autoimmune cost, try a vegan diet, like autoimmune paleo, whatever, some sort of intentional elimination diet, I think could be a very powerful adjunct for these autoimmune conditions. It could save people. I've, I've talked to countless people now, Derek, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. These are all N of one right? Or N of five, but Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, Sjogren's, eczema, psoriasis, right? Like you name the autoimmune disease. We've seen it effective positively by intentional dietary changes. My community is people generally cutting out plant foods. Um, Yeah. Like for Jada, presumably like whatever she's doing to date led to it happening. So it's like whatever her current lifestyle is equals her getting alopecia areata. So like, obviously something needs to change and it's not just like Uh, Like, I definitely am, I think anyone who understands the mechanism can understand how like flawed it is to see somebody have an autoimmune attack and then think, how do we bandaid it by suppressing your immune system rather than finding out like, why is your immune system like fucked up to begin with? You know, like that would be like, I'd be worried. Like, why is my immune system attacking organs? Like, that's terrifying. That was the reason, that was exactly what happened for me with my eczema. And I would get bumps, man. I get itchy bumps. People would say, oh, that's just, that's vanity. Well, I don't want yeah. itchy bumps because if my immune system is, att- is attacking my epidermis, what, what is it, what is triggering it? Something is pissing off my immune system. And people with autoimmune disease tend to get multiple autoimmune diseases. We know this. Um, and these overlap. So like, I don't want my immune system pissed off in general. Can't my body be more calm? I'm probably going to lead a better life if I can understand what my body wants and doesn't want. In general, is there a way you could explain in like layman's terms, like what leaky gut is and like why somebody might have an autoimmune reaction to like plant compounds or even like gluten or this or that. And then another person might tolerate it just fine and not have like, I don't know, the same gut permeability leading to like leakage and causing autoimmune issues. Like what is sort of going on at a base level that people can like wrap their heads around. Yeah. So in the gut, there's like a single layer of, of endothelial cells, the gut epithelium, and they're connected by a, a number of proteins that are, that are junctional proteins. There's tight junctions. There's this protein called zonulin. And so people need to understand that you're basically a donut. 
you put food in one end of the donut, it goes out the other end of the donut, right? You're a complex donut with a lot of twists and turns, but you have a big donut hole in the middle of you. And the middle of that donut is, is the difference between the outside world and the inside world. And that's separated by a single cell layer, the epithelium of the gut. And on the inside world, inside of your body from the gut is the majority of your immune system. People think it's in lymph nodes or your spleen, but there's lamina propria is a layer of your uh, gut wall that houses the majority of your immune system cells. And so there is like this demilitarized zone. This is like North South Korea, man. You know, there's like inside the body, outside the body with this diplomatic layer between them. And if that diplomatic layer opens, then undigested food proteins, the hypothesis that undigested food proteins can pass in and piss off the immune system. There's a bunch of highly trained Green Berets, snipers, and Navy SEALs on the other side of your gut lining. And they're just waiting for some bad guy to come across the fence and go blah, right? And so then they get pissed off and go other places in the body. So I've heard Alessio Fasano, he's a pediatric gastroenterologist at Harvard, one of the guys who's mainly popularized the notion of gluten hypersensitivity, even beyond celiac disease, talk about the fact that you can look at certain markers on immune cells and understand where they originated. And so in multiple sclerosis, you can find immune cells in the brain attacking the glial cells that wrap around the neurons that have originated in the gut or have markers that look like they're from the gut. Same thing in type one diabetes, you can find immune cells in the pancreas attacking the beta cells that look like they've originated in the gut. So, okay, that's really fascinating. That's this sort of gut mediated hypothesis of autoimmunity. Then the question becomes, what's pissing off the immune cells in the gut, many people have different answers. Some people would say dysbiosis, whatever, glyphosate, gluten, I think is a pretty big trigger for people because it is a lectin. I would say, let's, let's ask if plant compounds could be doing this because many plant compounds do have these lectins. This is a carbohydrate binding protein. They occur in all foods, but it appears that many of the lectins present in plant foods are more irritating to the gut. And the way this happens is you get some particle in the gut that looks like a bacteria. And then you get zonulin, which is this protein in the gut wall being released. And it's a signal to all these gap junctions in the gut to open. So the immune cells can come in and they get all pissed off and then proteins can pass across. So leaky gut is when something triggers your gut to open those gap junctions, immune cells go one way, proteins potentially go the other way. And you get this sort of mixing and the immune system can get overactivated. That's at least the overarching hypothesis. And the question is, are there food molecules that look like bacteria? Because evolutionarily, we would have wanted this to happen if a pathogen, a parasite or a pathogenic bacteria, Salmonella campylobacter get in the gut. We know that when we get gastroenteritis, if you did eat a raw egg that had chicken shit on it and you got campylobacter or you ate some raw meat and got campylobacter, you're gonna get leaky gut, right? If you eat a food and you get food poisoning, you better believe you have leaky gut. And so that's exactly what we want to happen evolutionarily for our immune system to sometimes touch the gut because sometimes we get bad things in there. But is it possible that food molecules have epitopes, regions of these molecules that resemble bacterial pathogen associated molecular patterns or damage associated molecular patterns, PAMPs and DAMPs, and that sort of triggers the leakiness of the gut and then initiating the immune response. I think it's a very compelling hypothesis, but wouldn't you know it, like mainstream Western medicine doesn't seem to give a shit about the gut when it comes to autoimmune disease. We, yeah. we balkanize this, man. We have, we have a gastroenterologist and then we have a rheumatologist. Wait, what? <laughs> like you have one guy that treats autoimmune disease and you have one guy that treats the gut. Shouldn't you like talk to each other? But no, everybody's like, oh no, that's me. That's you. So it's pretty scary stuff. It's interesting. No, even like endocrinologists. I'm not, okay. I don't want to like demonize like specialists or anything, but it's just like shocking how many specialists don't like stay up to date on literature or have like any open-minded, like, I guess they're dealing with patients all day. So, you know, maybe they're the last thing they want to do is, you know, sit down and read new studies and shit or test hypotheses. But like, oftentimes I'm shocked that even some of the patients coming into Merrick health and they've seen like a, like an endocrinologist specialist who overlooks something like super basic. Like we've diagnosed pituitary adenomas from individuals who were just told like you're depressed or you, you know, this or that. And it's just like, it's just baffling. Like some of the stuff, even on like blatant, like biomarker, like aberrations that it's like, Oh, you should probably look into this and like, see what's going on. That just gets overlooked entirely. I don't know. Yeah. If somebody has got a low testosterone and their prolactin is off the charts. Maybe you should look for a pituitary adenoma. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. I don't I don't know. It's kind of like you would know better than I like what kind of um, I don't know, like uh, process there is in terms of trying to learn all the different areas of medicine and like how much like uh, I know education is done in each like vector of the human body. But it seems like there's even in like the specialists, some of some of the education is like interestingly either outdated or doesn't encourage like further education or something. It's a it's a problem, man. I I'll say this. I I really think that the most of the research is funded by pharmaceuticals. So most of what we're taught in medical school is is procedural and pharmaceutical based. Mm. There's almost no nutritional discussion, no matter what specialty you go into, which is why I think it's, you know, it's, it's tragic. Like nobody learns about nutrition. Nobody learns about obesity. Never in medical school did I learn about broken adipocytes that hypertrophy instead of hyperplasia for insulin resistance. Like this is all postgraduate, post-residency, personal learning that anyone can do, right? Because Mm -hmm. you don't even have to be a doctor. Like you can read PubMed as well as I can. Um, there's tons of people in the space who have no doctoral degrees, you know, uh, case in point who are brilliant and can read the literature as well as anyone else. This is not, this is not some sacred text in the Vatican basement that only me, (laughs) you know, who's been anointed by the medical system, you know, patriarchy gets to go read it's bullshit. So, you know, but it's, we're trained to, to be siloed. We're trained to be myopic. We're trained to look at our organ system because that's how you prosper in medicine. The further you go in specialty, the more money you make, the more specialized you are with your drugs and the more specialized you are with your procedures. And everybody in medicine knows, and this is not to say anything about doctors, like doctors I have met in training postgraduate are invariably intelligent and well-meaning. It's the system that kind of puts us this way, Mm -hmm. but the way to make money in medicine is to be a proceduralist, to do a cath, to do a colonoscopy. That's how you end up with a better life as a physician. My dad was an internist. He got killed, you know, like not literally, but he worked himself to the, himself to the bone because he's the, the internists are some of the smartest doctors because they have to know everything. But the way mm-hmm. to really prosper in medicine financially is to become a specialist. And then you just know your one little, you know, inch, inch wide, mile deep thing, but then you don't understand how everything connects. So the medical system is built in a way that I think doesn't serve patients. We're not talking as specialties. We're not thinking about how all these things connect. And really there's no specialty that owns metabolic dysfunction. If anybody does, it's an endocrinologist, but I'll tell you what, like they're not, they're not going to understand metabolic dysfunction connecting with autoimmunity or connecting with atherosclerosis because then you're over at the cardiologist and then metabolic dysfunction can connect with depression. And then you're over at the psychiatrist and you're like, holy shit, man, <laughs> like you're just getting, you're just this pinballing around. Like it doesn't yeah. serve patients well, which is why who knows how we'll change it. But I think that there needs to be a lot more crosstalk and integration of these specialties so that doctors begin to see how it's all connected. There's not 76,000 diagnoses in medicine. In my opinion, it's like there is metabolic dysfunction and a few other ones. And if we can understand how to correct those, we can affect a lot of lives positively in a massive way. It's crazy. Can I show, before we go, can I show the pictures of this guy with the alopecia? Yeah, 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 sure. So this is actually pretty cool. So, um, this is, uh, August, 2017, you can see oh, this guy's wow. beard. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is just N of one. And then you can see him. This is the back of his head, right? It's the alopecia areata. And then um, he goes on to say that like, I think here at the end, he shows a picture of his beard, nice. like full, full beard. So that's pretty significantly improved, right? Mm -hmm. And then here is the back of his head. So you can see these patches like filling in. And this is super cool, like just an end of one, but I think it argues strongly in favor of the idea that dietary change could be really impactful for autoimmunity. In this case, he did carnivore, he cut out plant foods. Let's go further down the rabbit hole. Joe Rogan's talked about his vitiligo, which is a, you know, this melanin containing cells in the skin. He said on air, I actually want to ask him about it the next time I see him. Uh, that that gets better when he does carnivore too. And he's doing animal based now. He's including some fruit. Um, he had improvements with that, I think, relative to strict carnivore. So cool. Thanks for letting me share that stuff.